Before you start this episode, this is just a reminder that History Hack does have a Patreon account and a Ko-fi account as well. You can either register to subscribe and throw us a few quid every month, or simply buy us enough caffeine to continue through to the next episode. Because frankly, we run on fumes most of the time. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I've actually managed to sneak something under the radar because I was thinking the other day, it's been a while since I've had a chance to talk about Germany or the German armed forces, um, usually in the First World War, but I've decided to go for the wrong war this time. And I've got Jonathan Trigg with me, who is a historian who specialises in the Second World War, and he's written extensively on the subject, including uh, Death on the Don, Destruction of the German Army's Allies on the Eastern Front, D-Day through German Ice, and he's back today to talk to us about his new book, Barbarossa through German Ice. So Jonathan, welcome back to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Lovely, lovely of you to have me, Chris. And I've never heard the Second World War described as the wrong war like that, <laughs> like that a lot. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Let's turn to Barbarossa, the largest land invasion of, uh, of history so far. But in 1939, despite what the uh, Russian uh, <laughs> Foreign Office will tell you, um, Russia was allied with Germany. They invaded Poland together. But in 1941. Germany decides to invade but what what turned Germany against a Russian ally it, I mean that's a it's, a it's a very very good question I mean obviously when they signed the, the non-aggression pact in 1939 um, it absolutely shocked to the world um, and, and the reason for that is, is clear because as, as countries they were sworn enemies um, you know Nazism and communism were, were, were just at loggerheads um, and Hitler uh, ever since he's, you know, well, before his rise to power, when he's a, still a, a street um, uh, orator and so on, I made it clear that communism was was the enemy of humanity um, and, you know, should be destroyed. Um, and then, you know, so when the when the uh, when they, Hitler and Stalin signed their pact, everyone was surprised, um, hence less surprised when when Nazi Germany invaded. And, you know, the, the reason that, that, that Germany did that was that it was always going to, um, you know, Hitler made very clear when in, in Mein Kampf, uh, which you know, came out in 1925, um, that, that, that communism was the world enemy and that uh, Nazism was there to destroy it, rip it out, root and branch. Um, and, and so really he, what Hitler was doing, well, well, you know, from 39 onwards was was picking his moment. Um, and waiting yeah. till the right time. And for him, that was when Germany was ready. You know, when Germany was ready. And, and really, they were just, you know, they were waiting, waiting, waiting. I mean, the, perhaps an even more interesting question was, was what was Stalin waiting for something more? Was he waiting for an opportunity to, to attack Hitler um, at some future point? That, that will be, um, you know, a fascinating subject to, to, to look at. Um, but yeah, Hitler, Hitler was always going to turn um, you know, on Stalin and, and, and the Soviets. Um, it was just a matter of time. And 22nd of June 1941 turned out to be the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, years ago, I saw a documentary that um, the as a, a newsreel was shown to Hitler, I think it was in uh, Berchtesgarten, um, of Russian troops um, carrying out manoeuvres and um, being prepared. And they said uh, and that he was told um, that the Russians were planning a, a strike on Germany and he um and he said right well we're gonna have to get in there first I mean I'm not sure how true that is but uh and there was also a suggestion if we can take out Russia there'll be no hope for the British and we'll uh then we'll invade them next I, I mean I mean exactly I mean everyone everyone has always uh, and totally understood and rightly said why the heck you know did did, did Hitler turn and attack the Soviet Union before you know defeating us um, uh, so, and, and again, fascinating topic, not the, not the subject for today, but, but it's trying, it wasn't just about beating us in, 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 in our islands. You know, we had a global empire. Um, and, you know, it's, it's us against Germany. It's, it's the lion versus, oh, sorry, it's the elephant versus the whale. Um, yeah. with us, with us being, uh, us being the whale. You know, we were a naval power, global naval power that, that, that Nazi Germany wasn't. Germany was a land power. And of course, what, what it gave the Nazis by um, if they had a successful invasion of the Soviet Union was access to, to, to natural resources, you know, coal, oil, you, know, you name it, um, whatever that, that they were shut off from well, food as well being being a huge one. that They were shut off from by us and the Royal Navy. You know, the Royal yeah, Navy yeah. meant you, they can't get access to world markets. 
And, and, you know, Germany was struggling to feed itself. Um, you know, it had rationing, um, even at that stage. Um, uh, and so on. And, and it just simply, you know, needed resources and the Soviet Union had them. Um, so, so for, for the Nazis, it was a case of, right, we're going to, we're going to go in and steal it. There was no, there was no other way. I mean, they, they even had their hunger plan, um, which their economists had cooked up and so on, which was very, very clear, um, which was we are going to expropriate particularly the food, um, that the peoples of the Soviet Union lived on to feed Germans. Yeah. Um, and that meant that 30 million, um, and so on of the, the people of the Soviet Union were going to starve to death. And, and they, they factored that in and said, well, that's the, that's the plan. Let the, cut the, cut the cities off, um, from the surrounding countryside so food couldn't get in. Um, as the people starved, they would then, you know, society would break down. They would then, you know, leave the cities in vast numbers to get out to the countryside to try and find food. Whereupon, you know, as, as a, as an urban society, the Soviet Union would cease to exist and, and they, you know, become um, a, an agrarian, you know, peasant society of, of 200 years back. Um, it's all that will be ruled by, you know, a new German elite. Yeah, yeah. It's a late, uh, and there was the Lebensraum plan for the Ukraine as well, wasn't there? Very, very much. I mean, for, for all, I mean, they wanted to, they wanted to, you know, pave autobahns all the way from um, what was Eastern Germany and occupied Poland all the way down to the Crimea. With the mm. idea that, you know, that Nazis would then, you know, get in their lovely cars and zoom down these autobahns at, at top pace and so on to, to reach the Crimea and all of their, all the resorts on the, on the Black Sea coast, um, where they'd all have lovely summer villas and go on holiday. Um, yeah. And in between, there'd be, you know, vast farms run by, um, run by Germans, um, and so on, where all of, all of the workers were, were in effect local slave laborers who would be barely taught to read and write just enough to get by um and they will be yet yeah, ruled with a rod of iron by their german overlord the tool for the the main tool for for, for barbarossa is is the wehrmacht not so much the kriegsmarine but definitely the luftwaffe and here but and by early 1941 they're pretty much undefeated i mean ignoring sea line um and they've swept most of their enemies away but were they really that good or had their enemies just underestimated them, such as in like the, the fall of France. Bit of both, um, uh, to be honest, Chris. I mean, it, it's a, a, a warfare. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, you know this. You're a, you're you're you know, you're an expert on it. But but warfare is a lot to do with with initiative, you know, and who mm. has it, um, you know, and and at what point. And what the Nazis had, you know, up until uh, the invasion uh, of the Soviet Union and thereafter for some time after, actually, was that they always had the initiative. They could decide when to attack. So it was them who made the decision to attack Poland and, and so on. They then, when they turned uh, west and so on, again, they made the decision to take Denmark to invade Norway. Then, then again, after that was done, you know, did we attack? No. Um, uh, and so on. They picked their time to then hit, um, you know, Belgium, the Netherlands and, uh, and France. They can always, always pick their time when they were ready. Uh, and that has a big difference. And, you know, the, the, the German military, the Wehrmacht, as you rightly stated, was, you know, getting more and more experienced, um, building up that, you know, as, a, as a, it took the initiative and kept on invading countries and no one else was. So, you know, by the time that, um, you know, Hitler is invading France uh, and, and Belgium and the Netherlands and so on, his armies have already, um, you know, been involved in and, and won three three wars in effect in terms of beating Poland, beating Denmark and, and beating Norway. And yeah, Denmark was a, a, a few hours, of course. But that kind of military experience um, is invaluable. Um, and all the time we just underestimate it. I mean, the French, absolutely classic. Um, you know, at the time they had the second largest empire on the planet um, behind us. Um, they had the largest army, um, you know, in Europe, they had more tanks um than the germans did um and so on and yet you know their, their experience was was lacking um their command and control system was was shocking um and the morale of their forces and their population was was almost non-existent um, so so you know they, they let the germans come at them and the germans you know were were at that point yeah the, the finest army you know in the world um and so on so so yes they um uh, they just rolled over them to be honest yeah, they, they also had, um, on top of like the, the operations in Poland and, uh, the, the Scandinavia, a lot of them also had gained a lot of experience in, 
in the Spanish Civil War as well. And so they'd been practicing their methods and ide- ideas almost in like a, a sandbox where it didn't really make much difference whether that, if it went wrong or not. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's the that's the piece with them. The, the, you know, the, the Nazis, and, and we touched on this um, before in terms of the, you know, why did, why did they turn on? Why did they turn on the Soviets? Yeah, you know, the Nazis, Hitler was always going to have a war. He wanted a war. Um, none of it was by accident. Um, you know, he stumbled into the timing might have been um, and so on. He was taken aback uh, by the West reaction to the invasion of Poland. He thought he could, you know, dissolve Poland and then pick his time to uh, to go for the West when it suited him. Um, uh, and because they, they, you know, he'd have bought us off with something just as he did uh, after Munich um, in '38. So that that took him by surprise. But apart from that, he was always going to do it. So so you know, he was gearing up um, the country and the armed forces, getting, getting the Wehrmacht ready for a war that he wanted to fight. Whereas, of course, for us, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, and so on, we didn't want a war. We didn't want to fight. Um, you know, we might have to uh, and so on. And we kind of recognize that. But, but we didn't organize our armed forces and our, our society, you know, in terms of we are going to have a war because we want one. So we've got to get ready for it. It was it was no, we don't want one. So we'll try and get ready. But we're not going to upend society and you know radically alter the armed forces to get them ready for a war that we hope we're not going to have to fight. Yeah, yeah. And that, that, that sort of explains the uh, the failed Saarland uh, offensive in '39. There, there was just not the, from what I remember, there just wasn't quite the, kind of the enthusiasm for it from no, the French. Yeah. Exactly, because you know, for, for the French in particular, because I mean, our first world war and you know, our first world war experience was horrendous, but we, you know, we see it through our lens, um, and of course, yeah. but the French experience was absolutely was was just tragedy. Um, was was so bad, and of course they were desperate, as we were, not to repeat it. Um, so if there was any opportunity they could take that, that might give, give them even the slimmest hope of avoiding, um, you know, another war, where they thought well, they, they, it could happen like last time. Why not? We all end up yeah. with you know, in the trenches, absolutely butchering each other. Um, so they were just desperate to avoid it. To be honest, and, and I couldn't blame them for that, but you know, they they, they misunderstood um, their enemy at that stage. Yeah, yeah. So we were talking about the, uh, the the Germans striking when they're ready. Obviously, for Barbarossa, there's going to be a huge amount of logistics involved and planning and manoeuvring the army from the from the west to the east. How did the Wehrmacht prepare for for their attack? Uh, trying to reorientate all of their forces, as you said, from west to east was a was a huge, huge effort, uh, and and not just that, the infrastructure. So the, the Germans' plan was that they knew that they were going to have to make massive preparations in the east where, the, where there simply wasn't. You know, so, for instance, one of their big things, airfields. Um, so they they taken over, um, uh, you know, occupied Poland, taken over some Polish um, Air Force airfields. And so, but they went on a, on a massive building program across East Prussia um, and Western Poland. Um, occupy Poland uh, and, and right down, right the way down in order to 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 prepare themselves. So huge numbers of of um, airfields, of new supply depots, a building of roads, bridges, you know, you name it. Trying to put all the infrastructure in place that that the military was going to have to use, and then moving over, um, you know, the troops as they um, uh, as they you know became ready to take up their place in East. Because because of course what they couldn't do was was do that build up of forces, you know, over a, a, a lengthy period of time, a year or whatever, um, and so on, because, you know, they were desperately worried that the, the Soviets would, would twig it. Um, and they couldn't have that many troops just sitting there, you know, in the forests of, near the border for, for, for that long. Um, so they were having to do it in, in, in tranches. But of course, they also had to, to build up their own forces. Um, so, so a lot of new divisions were activated following the fall of France. They had to be trained. They had to be equipped, um, you know, and made ready. And then, you know, when, when finally, um, kind of in the spring of 41, the decision was made, um, you know, final decision, that's when they started to move everyone up in, tren- in tranches to, to, to near the border. Um, and the numbers, that's always everything about everything about Barbarossa is big. There is nothing small um, about the invasion of the Soviet Union. Um, I mean, j- just it's it's outlandish, you know, that, that the whole thing. I mean, we're talking about you know a, a front line that was eighteen hundred miles long, um, mm-hmm. and so on. Four million 
Germans and Allied troops from Finland, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Italy. You know, even there was even a division of Spaniards um, yeah, sent by, yeah, sent by, sent by um, Franco. You know, there's half a million vehicles, more than that I mean, in horses. Yeah, German army relied so much on horses, probably got six to seven hundred thousand of those. We've got seven thousand artillery guns. You know, we've got four thousand panzers and self-propelled guns, three thousand aircraft. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. Um, every time you look at it, you go that that's, that can't be the reality. But but it is. Um, and, and, and that's it. So, so the preparation was 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 painstaking um, and it was huge. But. You know, in the end, it turned out not to be enough. Yeah, yeah, which uh, we're going to get to. But we'll, we'll start with day one. Uh, campaigns always start well if you start with day one. Yeah. Um, and uh, the German Schwerpunkts, are, they're, they're really fragile in that, you know, they've, you've got the armoured punch, the armoured fist, but you could easily get around them. So how successful were the what were the German advances on the first day? Did they achieve their objectives? They, they did. I mean, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, they had the initiative because so they knew when they were going to attack. Um, you know, the Soviets didn't. They were taken completely by surprise. The Soviets, which, again, amazes me. The fact that because normally you know, the, the, the Soviets had an excellent intelligence network, if nothing else, um, on a global scale. Um, but they were just they were completely flummoxed. Um, and, and, and so, you know, when the artillery started, they were taken hugely by surprise. There were messages from their border troops going backwards, go, going, you know, we're being, we're being shelled and, 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 and so on. And of course, the, their headquarters are going, shelled by who? Um, you know, what, what are you talking about? And by the way, why are you breaking radio silence? Why are you in code? I mean, it's just, <laughs> just absolute madness. And, you know, it particularly, uh, cause in the south, that the, cause obviously the Barbarossa was split on the German side into three army groups. So, so mm-hmm. Army Group North, Army Group Centre, and Army Group South. They weren't called that at the, at the start. It was A, B, and C. But, but we'll just, to, for, for ease, we'll call them North, Centre, and, uh, and South. So South yeah. really didn't push push forward very much on day one. That you know they were um, for them, um, and so that was where the, the Soviets expected um, any attack to come through because it's you know the terrain was was very good for Panzers and so on and so on. So they put most of the, you know their largest forces down south. But actually, where the Germans really went for it was in the centre um, and in the north. And, and their advances were just incredible. So Army Group North, um, their spearhead was the 8th Panzer Division. Uh, and on the first day, it advanced 50 miles. Um, and, and when you think that, it's just, you know, 50 miles for a military advance on one day. Um, and so Quite impressive. It's just uh, uh, amazing. Um, but the biggest success that the, the Germans had on the first day was against the Soviet Air Force because okay. they were utterly paranoid um, about the, the the threat in the air from the Soviets because you know the, the the Soviets had the largest air force in the world by far um, and it was seen as a massive threat um, to to not just the advance but to Germany you know they knew that they, the Soviets had their own strategic bomber force and they thought that could not only hit Germany you know, bomb German homes, but could hit their oil supply um, in Romania in the, in the oil fields of Plurstein. And they were, they were absolutely paranoid about it. So, so they were ke- mad keen to, you know, get their aircraft over the Soviet airfields, you know, literally as the sun was coming up and then hit those airfields with everything they had. And, uh, you know, the figures are absolutely staggering. I mean, you know, they, they, stro- they destroyed almost 2,000 Soviet aircraft that first day, which is, which wow. is a qu- one in four of, of the Soviet Air Force's entire strength in the West. And, you know, those numbers are just, you know, astonishing. Um, and most of those were, were destroyed on the ground. In fact, mm. in fact the, the claims were so high that Goering didn't believe them. Um, so Goering thought, oh, it's, you know, my pilots, they're over, they're over claiming. They've got a bit of a history of that. Um, yeah. and, and, and so, so he says, no, no way it could be true. And of course, as the, as they then advanced, um, they find the, the wreckage. And so the, the Luftwaffe's own statisticians would then count up the, the numbers and, and actually confirm to Goering saying, actually, we think it might be more than that. And that, and that our pilots are actually underclaiming. Um, we've destroyed so many. So, so yeah, for a first day, it was hugely successful for the Nazis. With the German advance, there's a lot of uh, the, a lot of the local populace uh, started to see them as liberators because they hated Stalin. It had the Ukrainian famine. The 
sort of hallowed liberators that they are. And there's a myth has grown up over through popular memory of of the clean Wehrmacht, but the SS doing all the doing all the horrific stuff. But the clean Wehrmacht is a myth, isn't it? It, it, it completely is, and it and it you know it's very convenient, obviously, for the the, the mass. Um, of the German armed forces that no, no, nothing to do with us, governor. Um, you know, it's hear no evil, see no evil, all that type of stuff. Um, and it just simply isn't true. Um, you know, the, the, the evidence against it, um, you know, verbal, visual, written, uh, and so on is, is, is huge. Um, uh, you know, it's endless photographs of, of German soldiers photographing atrocities. Photographing, yeah. you know, um, um, executions, hangings, you know, even though they were banned, um, and, so, and sending them home, and you know, and you you read their letters um, and so on, because again, there's there's this big thing going, oh, censorship, censorship, censorship. Well, so, there's just too many letters. You know, if you think there's three and a half million German soldiers, um, yeah. you know, fighting at the front, and they're you know writing writing what a letter a week. How, in, 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 you know, how is any sort of censorship going to go through that and, 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 you know, black out and, you know, eradicate a, a, any mention? They're just not going to. Um, and of course, soldiers will go and leave and they talk about it. And, and yeah. they, they tended to develop a bit of a language. When I, when I've interviewed, um, a lot of, uh, former veterans, um, from the, from the Wehrmacht, particularly, particularly Waffen SS, because I've, I've done quite a few books on, um, on those guys. And that, that's, no, that's non-German, um, of often SS as well as German SS. So Danes, Norwegians, and uh, you know, Dutch, Belgians, and so on. They tend to use a kind of code, um, when they talk about, and that's if they want to talk about it at all. So if you want, if you try to cover the subject, um, you know, of atrocities and so on, a lot of them just don't want to, don't want to talk about it. But if they do mention it, the word they tend to use is partisans. Yeah. Um, so they say, oh yes, we, you know, we had to, we carry out an action against partisans in this area when, yeah, and, 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 you know, quite a few, quite a few hundred of them were killed. Um, and so on. And after a while, you get the kind of twig that, that most of the time they're not talking about, you know, what we would see as partisans, armed resistance fighters. Um, a lot of the time they just be civilians. Um, or, yeah. or, you know, even worse in Nazi terms, they'd be Jewish civilians. Um, and, and, you know, the ESS, of course, the Einsatzgruppen, um, and the Einsatzkommandos and so on carried out the mass of the shooting, but they were supported by German police units, um, Ordnungspolizei, um, and so on, and, and by normal, um, regular army units, um, who, who might well be involved in the, the actual killings themselves or would supply the logistics. So they supply the trucks, you know, the feeding, whatever it was. Um, and, and so, so, and, and soldiers talk. They're just like anyone else. Um, and, and word gets round. Um, I mean, I, I quote a, a German Red Cross nurse called uh, Annette Schicking in the book. Um, and she, yeah, she, she recounts that she spoke to, um, you know, two soldiers at least who were involved. Um, so normal soldiers involved in the shootings. Uh, and they, you know, their, their commanders had asked for volunteers. Um, you know, to, to, to work with the SS to take part in this type of thing. And, and, you know, one of them would say, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy to do it because it'll help, it might help get me promoted. Um, and, and she talks about that, you know, she saw that, that, that same soldier a while after and he, he said, yes, I, cause she pleaded with him not to, to, to take part, but he actually did. And afterwards she, she, she said he smelt of it. It was like his, you know, like his, his skin was exuding death. Um, and, and, you know, I can completely understand that. Um, cause this is, this isn't, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, execution by firing squad of an individual. And we're talking about mass murder. Um, yeah. Yeah. and that, that kind of thing, I think leeches into, into your very skin and your bones. Um, and so on. So, so I thought it was a very poignant and, and powerful description that, that she said she could literally this man smelt of death. Goldhagen's book, um, Willing Executioners, the, the, a lot of the police battalions turned to alcoholism to, to, to cope with it um, and were rotated home regularly because they, because of the psychological. I mean, I'm not, I'm not excusing their actions, but it did. It, the whole thing did affect them as well. Oh, ma- massively so. And, and you know, that's what 
I mean, it's it's the, the the I mean, it's again, it's very difficult, you know, as you rightly say, to talk about the subject in terms of and to you know use the right language in terms of you know because you can't you can't say fascinating or interesting or all this type of thing because because it it would seem to to you know to, to denigrate the the horror mm. and so on. But at the same time, it is interesting and it is fascinating. That's a horrible thing to say, but but you know that that. One of the, the huge reasons the Nazis, um, you know, had the Varnsey conference and turned to, you know, turned to, to gas, poison gas in the concentration camps, um, as, as preferred method of mass murder, um, was the psychological effects of the shooting, um, on their own people. Yeah. Um, you know, lo- lots and lots of reports up to, you know, Himmler and Heydrich and, uh, and so on saying, my God, we're, you know, we're turning our own people into into drunken psychopaths um, who who have to you know down a bottle of vodka um, in order to, to to pull a trigger um, and so on and we're destroying them. Um, there's got to be a better way in their terms, you know, a better way of committing mass murder. And you know that's that's where Zyklon B came in um, and so on because of course that tacked onto the um, the euthanasia program. Um, you know, the, 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 the T4 actions, uh, and they were going, actually, this is a, this is a, 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 a cleaner way, um, of doing it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the Wehrmacht, you know, they, they knew, so many of them did, um, and the commanders knew what was going on in their areas and so on, but they, it was convenient to, to dismiss it. The campaign continues to go well. Um, they, you know, through all, um, July, sort of August into September, the Wehrmacht are doing, continuing to sweep the Russians away. Why are they being so successful in these early stages? I, that's a very, very good point. I mean, partly it goes back to that earlier question that, that were, you know, we, earlier talk, we talked about, about, you know, the Germans were, the Wehrmacht was excellent um, at that stage. You know, it was, it was very well trained. It was very well equipped and it was, it was very experienced. And of course, you know, for, for the other side, it was almost the opposite. You know, Stalin had carried out a whole series of purges, um, uh, not only the Communist Party, but but uh, crucially the you know the Red Army um, and the Air Force and the, and, and the Navy and so on in the um, mid to late 30s, and and that had decimated um, its commanders um, in particular. So it, it it wasn't individual private soldiers who were purged, who were put on show trial and then um, you know found found guilty unsurprisingly and then cast off for execution in, in two minutes. Um, it was it was officers. And, and it was senior officers, you know, it was the marshals of the Soviet Union. It was the, you know, the corps commanders. It was the, the army commanders. It was the divisional commanders, you know, down to brigade level, down to colonels. Uh, mm. I mean, they were overwhelmingly slaughtered. Um, and, and that level of experience takes decades to build up. Um, it was nine of ten marshals, if I remember correctly. Yeah. There was only one. I think it was Budini was the only one to survive. Yeah, I, th- I think I think you're right. And it's just, you know, that 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 decapitates. You know, your military and they were, you know, so, so they're still learning and, and they were learning at the time also how to deal with, how to deal with Germans. The, the Germans were relying on mobility, um, through those early months. And of course the ground summer campaign, you know, ground is hard, great for, um, you know, panzers uh, and so on to move quickly. Um, and, and the, you know, the, the Soviets were, were fighting the, the wrong battles in the wrong places. You know, they would stay still, um, where they were. Um, and so, and only belatedly, you know, holding ground, um, and so on, that they didn't need to hold and then realizing too late, the Germans are behind them. Um, and, and suddenly they're in a pocket, uh, and they're cut off from supplies and reinforcements and, uh, and so on. And, and bang, you know, then, then what are they going to do? They, they can't break out and, and pretty soon they're, they're absolutely immobile. And that was the, the biggest, cause Stalin, you know, kind of, he stepped in and was very much, in effect, directing military operations through his surviving hierarchy, um, and so on. And you know, he's a politician, not not a not a soldier, um, and was continually making the the poor decisions. It was, you know, only a matter of time. Uh, well, it was it was a matter of time before um, he started to understand that you had to let soldiers do their job um, and get on with it. But by then, yeah, as you, as you said, you know, the, the, the Germans had made huge advances. Um, against an, an army and air force that was you know, not prepared. Always one of my favourite what ifs is uh, if Marshal Tukhachevsky was still alive in 1941, what would he have made of uh, the invasion? Because he was he was a genius. He, he was indeed, you know. And his his big thing 
uh, was deep penetration armored warfare. Um, yeah. you know, combined arms and so on. And that would have been absolutely fascinating to kind of see what he would have made of it. I think you're right. And, and what impact that, that would have, whether he'd be able to wield, um, the type of, you know, type of force that the, that the Soviets had at the time. I mean, that was a, you know, that's, that, that's always, I think it's one of the things that's kind of, you know, underplayed, which is it was German senior commanders had experience at, you know, coordinating and using forces at scale. So not just, you know, platoons, companies, regiments, you know, battalions, regiments and, and so on, divisions, but, but we're talking corps and armies. They, they'd done that. Um, and of course the, the Soviet officers hadn't, um, they had some large scale exercises, but of course they hadn't, you know, they're, they're usually, usually very inexperienced because they stepped into dead man's shoes, literally. Um, and they didn't have that experience of, of wielding the type of forces um, and the scale of forces that they had. Um, mm. And that's, you know, the Germans continually, um, not just at a, a individual troop level and what have you, but at, at, a, at a kind of big army level, um, were were just better at that stage of the war. Although um, one, of, one of the main things for the, uh, the Wehrmacht is uh, mobility, um, which is something they'd learned in with the uh, uh, Kaiser offensive in 1918. Ignore the hard points, go round them. In August, 22nd of August, Hitler changes his mind. He's not going for Moscow anymore um, because he's decided that to control, to try and take control of the, like we said earlier, the resources of the food in the Ukraine, the oil, um, try and interdict Russian oil and coal coming up from the Caucasus, maybe for the 1942's campaign. Um, but they end up in the siege of Kiev, which is not what the Wehrmacht was designed to do. How, how do they, how successful were they with it? It's, it's a, it's a fascinating piece. I mean, for, for Hitler always, well, Hitler never really viewed Moscow, um, in the early stages as, as the end goal. Um, you know, and, and he was always an economic warfare guy, um, in that way. And, and partly that was, you know, from, from his background, he, cause, you know, he was, he'd been a, a corporal, um, in the First World War. So, so we're not talking a senior rank. Um, you know, he wasn't even an officer, of course. And, and, and so he didn't have he didn't have that training um, that his you know general staff officers did, and he always felt you know um, a, a, he had a chip on his shoulder about it, um, and he felt they looked down on him um, because of that. A lot of them did. Um, so, yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah, exactly because of that because of that lack of formal military training. But of course, what he you know had that, that well, he believed he had that they didn't was an understanding of economics. Um, and, and so, so they saw the war in military terms. He saw it in economic terms. Um, and, and so partly, I think that the switch south, uh, to go for Ukraine and, uh, and all the resources, um, uh, you know, food and so on that, 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 that part of the Soviet Union offered was him almost cocking a snook, um, at his own generals and going, there you go. I told you, you know, what's important. And of course, Kiev was a, was a, was a classic. Um, you know, German, uh, encirclement battle on, on a vast scale. Um, I mean, we're talking, you know, the, the pocket when they, when they finally sealed it behind the, um, behind the Soviets, the pocket is the size of Slovenia. I mean, wow. it's just, <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's hard to get your, your, your head around, you know, the, 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 that can't surely be a pocket. It's too big. Um, you know, pockets are relatively small, you know, piece of ground with soldiers trapped on it. No, this is Slovenia. Um, and, and, you know, the, the Soviets tried desperately to get out. Um, you know, the, the, the picket line is, is very thinly held by the Germans and, and they're all trying to, you know, they, they charge endlessly and mowed down by machine guns. I mean, the casualties were, 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 were absolutely dramatic. I mean, the Soviets lost about a hundred thousand dead, um, in the Kiev mm. battle. Um, but then when, when it all ended, um, and so on. And the, the, the Soviets inside the pocket said, right, that's it. You're down tools and, and we surrender. It's, it's the, the numbers, the numbers were mind boggling and, and the, the Germans were, were, were totally shocked. And we're talking, we're talking about 665,000 prisoners. 
Wow. Um, you know, <laughs> that's and a whole army on its own. Oh, my, oh my, it's just incredible. You know, they're talking almost a thousand tanks, about 884. And, um, you know, almost a thousand tanks. I mean, you know, it's just, it's huge. A quarter of the, well, yeah, quarter of the German force of Panzers just in one battle. Almost mm. 4,000 artillery guns. You know, well over 300 aircraft. Um, I mean, it's just mind boggling. Um, the numbers. And of course, Hitler could then point his generals to that and say, and then literally say, I told you so. Um, you know, the, the Soviets, you know, knew they had to defend it because it's so important. Um, and look, look what we've done, look what we've achieved on, on my decision. You all wanted Moscow. You're all mad. I made the right call and, and look what we've done, um, you know, on the back of it. Um, and that's, that's, that's very much how he, you know, how he portrayed it. Yeah. Yeah. It leads quite nicely into the next question because we were going to ask about the, with, with the Red Army's collapse. Kiev's not the only place, but they, they end up with I think it's like well over a million prisoners. I think. And it, uh, how how do the Germans treat these prisoners? Um, are, and are they able to um, are they able to look after them in the same way that they're looking after uh, British and French POWs? It's, that's that's an excellent question. It's one that one that I think has, has been kind of under under investigated if you like by um you know by a lot of people in in you know previously and so on because i mean we're taught for me for me that, that you know the crime that the germans committed against the, the soviet prisoners of war is is a, of a truly monstrous scale um and involves and involves so much of the um of the wehrmacht that said it had nothing to do with atrocities i mean in totally i mean we're talking you know Combine the, 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 the POWs from Kiev and from the nearby Battle of Oman and so on and so on. You're talking about a million, but overall bringing all of the, um, you know, the, the, the prisoners total from, from that summer, um, and autumn fighting, you're, you're talking between two and a half, three and a half million, um, mm. that, that, that they've taken. I mean, just huge numbers and they were hugely experienced. The Germans by that stage of the war were the most experienced army in the world at dealing with prisoners of war. I mean, of course they were, because they'd invaded yeah. lots of countries already. <laughs> <laughs> they were, they were the ones who ran prisoner war camps. And, and overwhelmingly, um, those, those POW camps, um, and so on were, you know, they're inspected by the Red, International Red Cross. They conform to the correct standards. Um, and so they're not nice places, of course. Um, but for, but for, you know, British and French POWs, you know, Belgian, Dutch, whatever. And so they are treated, um, um, well. Um, and they are looked after. Lots of, of, repat- lots of pa- repatriated, for instance, all of the Belgian Flemish were about a hundred and, uh, over a hundred thousand actually of those were repatriated within a few months of, of, of being captured for various reasons. So the Germans knew what, how to do it. Um, and of course they, and, and they anticipated that they were going to have to take millions of prisoners because, because they, you know, their, their view was we're going to invade the Soviet Union, which has the biggest army in the world. And we're going to beat them. And to beat them, we don't have, we, you know, that is about the destruction of the, the, the Red Army. We can't kill all of them. There's too many. Therefore, you know, logic dictates we are therefore going to capture huge numbers of them. Um, and, and then their thinking just stopped. Um, there was just no provision at all. And the way that, the way that the kind of, ever since the, 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 the war ended, the way the German hierarchy, the military hierarchy portrayed that was they were just overwhelmed. Uh, and so everything that happened, which was, you know, mass starvation, disease, atrocity and so on, was all by accident. It was, whoops, um, we didn't mean, we didn't mean to kill a couple of million Soviet prisoners. Um, and so on. But it, it's, they just simply didn't care. Mm. Um, and, and, and they made no provision. Um, and so literally they were just, you know, these guys would be herded and herded is the word because they, they treated them like human cattle. Um, into, you know, into a valley that would be ringed by a couple of pieces of barbed wire. Um, if they were lucky and a few guards and then just left there in under the baking sun, you know, no water, no food. Um, and so anyone that tried to, 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 you know, kind of storm the wire, machine guns uh, and so on. And pretty quick people started, you know, they died of, of thirst, you know, then, then hunger, you know, and then, and it's disease starts to, to rattle through and, and, you know, they knew what was going on. I mean, there was a general uh, called Max Siri, who um, I can imagine wasn't a particularly pleasant individual. Uh, so he was a German uh, divisional commander. And he, you know, saw what was what was happening at the front. They were taking so many prisoners. And he wrote a report to his superiors where he actually suggested what we should do 
rather than go through all this rigmarole of, you know, getting the prisoners and then using troops to take them, you know, out to the front line and to, to these makeshift camps and having to deal with them, we should just, you know, either shoot them in the arm or cut off a leg. Um, and then, then, then they can't fight us for at least a month. Um, and so on, if they can ever fight us again and what have you. And then we can, so we can pick them up later. Um, once, once the, once the job done. And he was amazed when his, when his suggestion wasn't acted upon. Um, <laughs> that, 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 well, I, go, I can't believe it. They didn't cut all their legs off. Oh, absolute <laughs> nightmare. Um, and, and so they, they really did. They, they behaved appallingly. And, you know, I think it was without doubt, um, a, a, a war crime and, and a vast, vast war crime. Um, the, the, the Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht was, was compliant in. Yeah. And of course, it would come back to haunt them later with, after um, Stalingrad. Yes. You know, the German prisoners, uh, German, Italian, Romanians, and Hungarian prisoners were treated just as barbarically. Yes, I mean exactly, and that's a you know in that, in that sort of war, um, you know, you, you you get what you give, reap what you sow, and yeah. all that type of stuff. And they most definitely did. Um, and it, you know, it's just yeah, it's 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 they should have they should have behaved far far better than they did. Um, and it was just, yeah, it was appalling, utterly appalling. Um, you, you use a lot of uh, testimony uh, from the men in the front, uh, like the guy we were just talking about. But how did how did they actually feel about the campaign? Another very good question. They, they were overwhelmingly, they were, and this is from their letters, diaries, interviews with them, uh, and so on and so on. At the time, they felt it was the right thing to do. Um, they felt that the Soviet Union was a threat. Um, they, you know, a lot of them thought, very, you know, as we subject we touched on before that that you know if if we don't you know we need to get in first um before they come for us uh and so on so they felt that it was the right thing to do that and they you know a lot of them had been involved in the western campaign they'd seen um you know france belgium the netherlands countries like theirs so they thought oh civilized europeans and so on and of course the nazi worldview was that everyone to the east you know the slavs um, and so on. They 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 lived in squalor. Uh, they were, you know, untermensch. We're talking about subhumans here. Yeah. Um, and of course, a lot of the a lot of the Germans of the advanced. That's what they found um, in terms of their views. So they were going, oh, what is what are these people going to be like? We've been told that they're subhumans, and I think they might be. Oh my goodness, you know, they're they're, they're they've hardly got any metal roads. Um, families live in one room. Um, you know, in a, in a peasant isba, um, and it's, it's filthy and it's, there's no cleanliness, et cetera, et cetera. Water comes from a well. There's no electricity. Um, all of their, all their clothes are infested with lice. They all sleep on top of an oven. Um, you know, they, most of them can't read and write. Um, all this, so, so they viewed that and they thought that, you know, Hitler, Hitler and the Nazis are right. Um, these people are subhuman. Um, and, and, you know, it's absolutely right what we're doing. Um, and there were very few of them at the, at the time um, that I've, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there. The, the, the evidence that I found who were going, oh, my God, this is wrong. Um, we, you know, we shouldn't be doing this. Um, and so a lot of the, a lot of them were going, this is absolutely the right thing to do. You know, and, and you know, we're, we're on the right track. I mean, there was there was one soldier. Uh, called Hans uh, Hans Roth. Um, I mean, he was just a normal, um, you know, member of the of the German army and infantryman. Um, you know, not not a member of the Nazi Party um, or anything like that. And he left uh, a diary because he was killed later on in the war. If, mm-hmm. and, and his diary, you know, is a particular first you know, opening weeks of the campaign. It, it's he's he's rabid against these uh, against the Soviets. Um, He's not, oh, this is, you know, killing people and, 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 and it's not nice and, and so on, but you know, it's, it's what, what has to be done. He's going, they are subhuman. They are barely, you know, they, they can be barely called, you know, uh, the same species as us and we need to exterminate them. Um, you know, and, and that's how he, that's how he frames them. He frames them as, as, you know, animals to be slaughtered. Um, and, and yeah, you know, like I said, normal guy. Um, I mean, others, there's, uh, there are two pen pals, um, actually, with Eugen Altroger and Hans Albring. Um, and they were, again, normal, just German soldiers, and they'd be members of a church youth group um, together before the war. And you know, they kept up correspondence and so on. And, and you know, these were, these were um, devout Christians. 
Um, and they obviously didn't go anywhere as far as, as, as people like Roth did in terms of, you know, oh, these are subhumans and so on. But they really didn't find that much to, you know, to criticize in what was going on. They saw it as well. It's, 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 it has to be done. Um, it's them or us. So let's just, let's just get on and do it. Um, but it is, you're absolutely right. It's fascinating to read. I mean, you know, particularly all of the, you know, the letters. Um, you know, so many letters that I, I went through and they're talking about, I mean, obviously, because yeah, in between all of the phrases, it's going, you know, how's, you know, how's Auntie Margaret or, or whatever. And, you know, oh, yeah. have you, have you bought that coat for the winter that you were looking to get? Oh, and by the way, um, we had this fight in this village yesterday where, you know, oh, you know, you know, my, you know, my friend, you know, Jochen, yeah, he got his head blown off. Um, and, you know, they, they wouldn't surrender. So we set fire to all of the, all of the houses and they all mm-hmm. came running out, um, all on fire and we just let them burn. Um, and, and love and, to the kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah lo- love, love, love to the kids. Pat little Heinrich on the, on the, on the head for me. And, and, and it's just surreal. Um, it's surreal kind of reading that and so on. But, but yes, there was definitely not a, a widespread feeling among the, um, among the soldiers that this was the wrong thing. It was a case of, yeah, and, and we're going to win. That was a, yeah. a, a overwhelming thing that's coming through, particularly in the, the first few months. There was no kind of you going, Oh my God, you know, this is, we've bitten off more than we can chew here. They're all like going, this is, we're going to win and yeah, back home for Christmas. But we, as we know from history, the wheels do fall off from Barbarossa. Where does it go wrong and why does it go wrong? I mean, that's the, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, you know, I, I would say, um, that it, 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 went to go wrong from from the moment the plan was put together because i can't find i mean i mean no, i've been a student of warfare um my entire adult life and i've been a you know i was a soldier, a soldier for, for some of my adult life and i've been a practitioner of it for some of my adult life and i cannot find in all of the documents that i've read about barbarossa and, and, and what have you a, a clear plan about what success looked like that, that makes sense. I mean, everyone goes on, they have the, you know, the AA line. So, so, you know, Archangel in the north all the way down to, to Astrakhan, um, you know, in the south on the Caspian Sea, uh, with Gorky in the middle. And once the Germans reach that line, we say, yes, that's it. We've won and so on. But if you actually look at that line on a map, um, and so on, it, it, the, the vast majority of what was then the Soviet Union isn't in it. Mm. Um, you know, they, they've got huge, Huge amounts of land, resources, people, and so, of course, you know, the Western Soviet Union, um, uh, was, was the majority of the population and, you know, industry and commerce and so on, of course, yeah, and that, that's understood. But, but, but for me, if, you know, if the Germans had ever got there, the war wouldn't have, wouldn't have ended because it, this wasn't, you know, it, it, it wasn't a normal war, um, in that regard. So, so they invade France and they know take Paris. Yeah, take Paris and basically, you know, uh, you, you, you've taken the French capital. You're going to win pretty quickly. Uh, and, and, yeah. you know, you, all you have to do is reach, reach the coast, you know, reach the coast in, in the Bay of Biscay and Brittany and down in the, down on the Med. Cause those are the, those are the borders. That's the boundaries. You know, once you've got that, you've got it. It's done. Um, and so on. And that, and you know, then that the French are going to surrender because what you haven't said to them is what, what in effect Hitler and the Nazis were saying. To the, to the, you know, the Communist Party and Stalin and so on is, is, well, when the war ends, however it ends, what we want to do is kill you all. So, so we're not going to negotiate, you know, your government isn't going to fall and then we just occupy the place. Um, and so on. And then we're going to go off and do something else. It's, it's not like, no, 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 our, you know, our view of any sort of victory is that you are exterminated. You're gone. You know, communism is gone. You know, all the party members, they're all dead. You know, everything is destroyed. Um, and so, and of course, so, so there's no out. I mean, it's like the parallel now with Putin, um, you know, Vlad, Vlad the invader, um, yeah. you know, in, in, in Ukraine. Everyone was going, you need to offer him an off ramp, as the, as the term goes, a way out, um, you know, of the war. And, and I have some sympathy with that in terms of a, in terms of a strategy to, to, to bring it to a, bring it to a successful end, i.e. when, when, when Russia is kicked out of the, of the Ukraine. But of course, that's what Hitler and the Nazis weren't giving Stalin or the Communist Party. They gave them no off ramp. No way. It's like, we're not, we'll, we'll beat you militarily, 
and then politically we'll negotiate and we'll come to some sort of agreement and then the war will be over. And equally, they weren't saying that to the, to the, to the Soviet peoples. The Soviet peoples, it wasn't like we're going to, you know, when we win, don't worry, you'll, you know, we'll free you from communism and then you'll, you know, uh, um, you'll be free to follow your own, uh, your own path and so on. It's, it's, yeah, we win and then we're going to starve you to death. Um, yeah. and, and so having, having no properly thought out plan was, was, was for me, you're starting the invasion on a, on a completely false premise. And the, 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 the second, um, one I think was that was the, complete underestimation of 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 distance and logistics and what that actually meant um so of course you know you look at a map and you start with your you know 1800 miles of front and what have you and the 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 further you go in further germans go into the soviet union the bigger the front line actually gets you know it it fans out and just increases exponentially um Mm -hmm. So, so your forces, which were fairly concentrated to start with, will naturally just thin out as you go. I mean, you know, from, from, so you capture Paris. So from Germany, you know, to Paris, we're talking, you know, 100 odd miles, something like that, or 200 miles away. Um, so it isn't, it isn't far at all. But of course, for, from where the Germans were starting, it's, it's 500 miles to Leningrad. It's 750 miles to Moscow. And you're not even there yet. And that yeah. sort of that sort of logistics, they just weren't ready for. Um, you know, the, the, yeah, the way the way that a campaign like that has to be structured, it, it isn't just about the forces that you've got to deploy on day one, day two, day three, um, and so on. It's it's how you bring more f- and fresh forces, you know, through um, into you know into the front line from the second line from the third line. Yet you know, you're constantly you know if you like resting troops, bringing them, bringing others through, and so on, and so on, as the as the campaign progresses, you know, month after month. And of course, they just they just didn't do that. So as, especially when your army is reliant, on, I mean, there's that belief of that the Wehrmacht being uh, mechanized, which is just not entirely true. They had a mechanized force but the majority of them are, are horse based so you bring up a hell of a lot of supplies by horse and the Russians had a different size railway gauge and they were destroying stuff as they went so it's not like between Germany and France you could just quickly repair the railway lines and then run your trains bringing up supplies and men with the Russians you've got to completely rebuild the railways from scratch and exactly and that's yeah, and they knew that um and so but they didn't yeah, you know, they didn't. They didn't go. Oh well, this is going to be a major problem. They go. Well, we can rely um, a lot on road transport. But then again, they also knew that the, the Soviet Union barely had any metalled roads. So, yeah. so you know, these were these were sand and dirt tracks in the main uh, and so on, that couldn't take you know armored vehicles, that couldn't take lorries and uh, and so on. So, on, and a bit of rain turns turns them into quagmires. And you're absolutely right. Yeah. The German army and well, uh, you know, German armed forces relied overwhelmingly on horses. You know, I mean, one of the one of the things that relates to, to the last question in terms of what the, the soldiers um, you know, thought during the early campaign and so on, and what comes through in so much of the uh, of the evidence is that they were all just knackered because what they were doing day after day after day, week after week, month after month, was marching and marching twenty, thirty, even forty miles a day. Um, and just that's that's it. so so you know they weren't in in the back of an armored half track or even in a truck going forward and so on no no that was for that was for the relative few um, yeah. and so they were literally you know they would fall asleep where they where they stopped um, and be utterly exhausted and then up the next morning before it's light um, you know quick bite to eat and so on, and then off they go again. Um, and it's just so, so they are advancing at the pace that these guys can, you know, uh, uh, what Roman legionnaires did. It's how far can you yeah. walk in a day? That's that's where you're going to go. And they just, you know, the, the, the horses and they should have known. I mean, obviously, when Na- Napoleon did in 1812, um, you know, that the European horses, that obviously that's um, uh, what his, his army relied on, the Grand Armée relied on at the time. And, and they all died. Um, yeah. you know, because looking after a horse, I've never done it. Um, you know, not into, not into horses, uh, you know, the equine thing in a, in a personal sense, but I know people who do, and it's, they're a lot of hard work. Um, you really got to look after these things. Um, they, you, you can't just rely on them every day, you know, you tie them up on a, on a rail the next day, just jump on its back and, and off it goes. No, no, they're constantly going wrong. 
um, you know, horses. They, they, you know, shoes fall off. They need to be fed proper diets. They need to be water. They need, you know, they need vets to look after them because they can't eat that. And if they do, they get sick. And then they, oh my God, it's an absolute nightmare. Um, and of course, these yeah. things that these things, oh yeah, to mix the metals, horses are dropping like flies. And, and, <laughs> you know, and then they're, and then the, you know, all of a sudden the German advance is, 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 is getting just incredibly snarled up. Um, and they didn't, and they knew this. And this is what, you know, and this is again what I don't understand looking because it, it all comes down to the planning. And, and so much I think of the, of the, of the planning and the, and the reason it therefore, you know, went wrong, um, you know, for them was that, was that they were just literally crossing their fingers. And they just made assumptions on a gigantic level that, oh, we only have to do X. You know, what what did Hitler say? Oh, you know, it's feet of clay. All we have to do is kick the door down and the whole thing will come crashing down. And and yeah. they went for it. These, these highly experienced professional soldiers, you know, German general staff and so on, swallowed it. Hook, line and sinker. Yep, yep, you're absolutely right. That's what we'll do. All we have to do is, is, is have a few victories and then they're all just, you know, go home, throw up their hands and, and it'll just collapse. And then we don't have to worry yeah. about it. Uh, it is the proverbial, we're, you know, we're home by Christmas. Um, madness. Utter, utter madness. Yeah, and abs- absolutely. Like we said at the beginning, it's the, the largest land, land invasion of, of history and it's still something we're, we're talking about now. And I don't think in early 1941 anyone in in Berlin could see it going wrong. But <laughs> no, no, I mean hubris. Yeah, hubris is yeah. a is is a natural human emotion. I completely get it. And as we touched on earlier, um, you know, in the in the in the podcast, they won every single time. Um, and and you know, they kind of looked at Hitler and said, "Well, we said that he shouldn't, you know, reoccupy the Rhineland. We, you know, we said he shouldn't do the Anschluss with Austria. We said he shouldn't do this and, you know, shouldn't do this and that. And every single time he's been proved right. So he's bound yeah. to be right this time. And then look at what we can win. You know, why is it always a speedboat? And, and, but that's the, that's the, that's the thing is they're looking at it going, this is, this is, the, this is the big prize. What's behind door number one? Oh, it's everything that we've always wanted. You know, a global empire. Um, and so on that we Germans can rule and, ah, oh, and look at the unlimited power that we'll have as the military. I mean, the generals love to have, you know, soldiers and they're given, don't worry, you know, you can, you know, we'll win this one and then you can have, you know, more soldiers, more tanks, more guns, more planes, more everything. Um, and so on and, and more medals. Wouldn't it be fantastic? And they, they absolutely took it all in and said, yes, it will be. We've got to do it. You know, this, this will be, this will be amazing. We can't lose. Um, and of course, the the opposite was true, which was just they can't win. Q Marshal Zukov. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that was a that was a bit of a wake up call. Um, and, and of course, yeah, I mean, you know, typhoon failed, and then obviously the you know the, the Soviet um, counteroffensive in front of Moscow, and that that, that destroyed the German the German armed force. I mean, the, the Wehrmacht in the um, in the spring of 41, you know, that's it, you know, just for, uh, invaded the Soviet Union. I mean, that was, you know, the most powerful army in the world, um, at that time. And it really was at the very, very height of its strength. And as we talked about, you know, it had, had nothing but success up until then. And, uh, but in that, you know, that, that winter offensive, it died. Um, and was never the same, you know, animal ever again. Um, it was, it was really fighting for survival. From then onwards, and you know, no one really understood that. Um, you know, I mean, I know the forty-two campaigns for for uh, another time, but that was it. Even then, they were going, you know, oh, how are we going to win? And they still didn't know. They still didn't go. How are we going to win? It was just about, you know, we'll have a battle and we'll win a battle. And you're like going, yeah, we've had a lot of those, and we and we haven't, and we've won all of them, but we haven't won. So what's going to be different about this battle? Well, I don't know. Um, yeah. And that's not really a good answer <laughs> for a general, which is, I don't know how we're going to win. You've got to know at the start how you're going to win. And they didn't. No, no, I really want to open the 1942 uh, rabbit hole, but we'll do that <laughs> after, after the, we'll, we'll chat afterwards. Because uh, <laughs> we could be here all day. But, exactly. um, remind everyone the, the title of your book. Great. So the book is called Barbarossa Through German Eyes, The Biggest Invasion in History. Um, and so and I hope that I hope people enjoy it. And if you want to make any comments uh, on it, I've got a, a website. So www.jonathantrig.co.uk. Go on there and tell me 
if you like it. If you don't, if you don't care, <laughs> just you know, any, anything, any comments from anyone will be most welcome. Yeah, and we'll try and get it on uh, the History Hack bookstore, online bookstore as well, uh, bookstore.org. That will be very good. always common. get wrong. Um, and that way we can maybe deprive uh, Jeff Bezos from uh, funding his own firm. I don't know, that will get me fired. And yeah. uh, funding <laughs> something evil. Don't ignore what I just said, uh, allegedly. Uh, <laughs> I'm with oh, you on God. that. <laughs> and I'll end up in court. I haven't got any money. Um, but, Jonathan, thanks very much for uh, coming and talking to us today. Chris, thank you very, very much for having me on. Really, really appreciate it and really enjoyed it as usual. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.